right, good morning. My name is Sean Kim. I'm the president and chief product officer at Kajabi. I'm absolutely honored and thrilled to be introducing Kenny Ruder and uh, Jonathan uh, Kronstadt. And then, uh, so Kenny is the executive chairman and founder of Kajabi, and you're a valuable board member of our company. So today we talk about the creator economy, um, what's changing in the creator economy, uh, as well as some tips we can give our creators going forward. So with that said, one of the first questions we want to ask is, what are some of the biggest changes you see in the creator economy since the founding of Kajabi? I mean, first of all, hi everybody. I noticed so many of you in the chat here. It's great to see so many f familiar, you know, people in there. Uh, I'm glad you brought that up because I see a lot of requests for Baby Shark, and I want you to know if we had a studio that had the room for me to really do it justice, I would. Because now with my two-year-old daughter doing it, I learned all of the appropriate moves, and I can tell you the performance would be better than ever. But we don't have time for that today. And if you keep asking, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> No, so, I mean, so much has changed, right? It's been 11, 12 years, I don't know, 11 years maybe. And, and so much has changed, but yet again, so much hasn't, right? I think, I think the biggest change is, is it's a maturing industry, right? I mean, it's so much more popular today than it was mm -hmm. and, um, you know, when we were just getting started. And, you know, but the basic fundamentals are the same. People have some knowledge that's valuable to other people and, and they want to market that. And so I, I think at its core, it's the exact same. It's just way more popular now. Yeah, I really think that what's so challenging is a question like what has changed implies that there are things changing that are going to impact you being able to create the type of business you want. And the reality of it is the only things that have changed really are just moving in place to support you. That if you think about the world we're looking at today, the complete reevaluation of all things that we used to think were foundational, unshakable, they broke. You look at all of the things that we thought were a must, like going to offices or being in an employment position that you didn't love, but you didn't know that you could leave it. So if you look at the societal trends we have today, like the great resignation, the complete lack of passion and interest in what you're doing, you are in the place of an industry where no matter what you're doing, somebody out there right now is either looking for the passion you have, the proficiency you're assisting with, the professional growth path that you're supporting, regardless of the category you're in, right now someone online wishes they could already find you. So if you're asking me, the only thing that's changed is it's gotten easier. Yep. You no longer have to try and explain to people that these things used to be books and workbooks and CDs and DVDs and we're gonna ship them to your house. Mm -hmm. This is now available in real time whenever you want. They just need you to be there. And the tools are so much easier too. When we started, and some of you in the chat have been around for quite some time, there was still some complexity, right? And, and Kajabi is just making it easier and easier and easier. And so really, you know, the takeaway for me is there's no excuse, right, to, to just get started and, and to share your knowledge. Yeah, I think when you, when you ask questions like what has changed, you look at a set like this, and I was on the chat earlier this morning grabbing a, a bite before we headed in here, and a lot of people are asking, well, how many team members do you have working on this? So what kind of camera setup are you using? And what's all the software that you're using? And I mean, literally, it gives you the impression that like, well, gosh, if I don't have 42 cameras in like a, a tree that you can hide behind in your set, <laughs> that you're not gonna be successful. And it's just not the case. You could literally be doing exactly what we're doing now if you have an iPhone and a tripod, and guess what? If you have transformational value that you're offering, nobody's gonna be asking why you didn't use a better camera. Nobody's gonna be pointing out the lighting that only you notice that casts that shadow on your face that's keeping you from recording. It literally is an industry that is coming into its own and we're only just getting started. So believe me, if you don't start now, you're going to be looking back five years from now asking me what's changed and the only thing I'm gonna be telling you is you should have started today when you were watching this broadcast. Yep. Awesome, awesome. So now that we've talked about what's changed, what would, you have, what would you say have stayed consistent or constant uh, during the time you've worked at the, in the knowledge economy? Well, I'll tell you the one commonality of every successful Kajabi hero, and that's grit, right? And, and everybody in the office here, when I was here every day, I mean, got sick of me saying it, but it's, you, you have to have that grit. And I don't care how easy the software gets. Um, you, you have to be committed. Uh, you know, there, there's never going to be an easy button that makes money just shoot out of your monitor. You know, um, you, you gotta you gotta believe in what you're saying and sharing, and and also just be willing to iterate. You know, your first video, uh, you know, that might have that weird shadow on your face. Uh, you know, might not be the best. Why and did you point to my face when you said <laughs> weird shadow? That's well, it. I can't work like this. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, well, so. <laughs> It's just like old times. See, we I told know. you, you don't even need to be professional to do this. No, we were you laughing don't have to. about this earlier. That we used to do stuff like this just to mess with each other on camera. So that's what you're watching. We've just yeah. missed it. Yeah, and 
And you can always iterate, right? And you, your next video might not have that awkward exchange we just had, you know, and you can always get better. And so I think just sticking with it and, and just saying, okay, nothing is gonna stop me from being successful. Yeah, there's no doubt, Kenny could not be more correct that grit is the number one quality that I think we've found is the common success indicator that has never changed in this industry. Even going back to the 1900s when people were ordering books via correspondence from Success Magazine, it was the grit of somebody that wrote a letter, got the book, took action on it, that piece has been foundational. The other thing I would say is, again, going back to that just getting started, just gaining momentum, I would quote Peter Diamandis, who's uh, on Kajabi, he always said, if you are not embarrassed of the first iteration of your product, if you are not embarrassed by what you ship first, you waited too long to ship. So if any of you right now are embarrassed with what you have, good news, it's time to take it live. Awesome. So how do you think the creator economy is gonna change or evolve in the next few years, like five to 10 years from now? I mean, for me, I think it is getting more popular, mm -hmm. right? And, and, and platforms like TikTok and, and it, these, these people that are in it for the eyeballs right now are, are starting to realize, wait a second, this is cool, I'm famous or whatever, but I'm not making any money and they're gonna wanna <laughs> get right. serious and actually start monetizing. And so I think, I think the changes are going to be a new set of people coming in that expect it to be even easier, right? right? And and shorter attention spans, and and maybe maybe some of the formats, uh, you know, long format courses mm -hmm. are going to be uh, replaced with some some shorter, uh, you know, geared for people with shorter attention span type thing, and so. Uh, you know, all of those changes are happening, but like I said, I think the core principle remains. You know, if you if you stick with it and are provide value to your audience, uh, mm -hmm. the success is going to follow. Got it. Got it. Okay. So next question is uh, how many? So any creators or strategies to note that you're currently observing? I mean, there there's so many people that mm -hmm. that are just having the success, right? Mm -hmm. I. I, I I'm trying to think of some specifics uh, right now. I, I don't know if you can, but like. Yeah, so when you look at the strategies that I think are really working today, you're seeing a lot of people test the boundaries of how to package their offering. So previously, if you go all the way back, and this is gonna be dating Kenny and I quite a bit, but if you go all the way back to the very beginning of Kajabi, you could almost not find an online course that was not priced at 1997. Every course was priced at $1997. $1997. $1997 with a four pay or a six pay option. And almost every course that was available back then was priced that way. Now, to be fair, there were probably only 50 or 100 people that were really selling courses at volume at the earliest stage of this industry. You're now seeing a lot of people beginning to really play with the elasticity of, does my audience want a lower priced offering as a one time, as an introduction to my methodology? Do they want a low price subscription where they know they're going to be getting content every single month? I think podcasting for me is an area where you're going to see unbelievable innovation in super low priced, super consumable, but paid podcasts, not like, hey, I'm trying to get ad revenue and hoping for the best. Mm -hmm. You're going to see that pricing elasticity continue to change, but what's not going to change is all of those different pricing and presentation options are designed to do one thing. That is to introduce somebody to you that grows to know, like, and trust you that can engage with you in different ways. So what I would say the future is going to look like and the strategies are going to be working are exactly what's always worked. It's just going to be applied in areas of media that it might not have been applied to before. So podcasting today, lots of people are gonna wake up and find out they're never gonna get enough downloads to get ad revenue that'll buy them more than a sandwich. But that same amount of downloads, if in a subscription-oriented podcast, could be a full-time job. So I think you're going to see that pricing and packaging really drive a lot of innovation in the industry. But bear in mind that even with that pricing and packaging, it doesn't mean you need to reinvent your business today, redo all of your pricing today. It means you consider adding it. It means you consider bolstering your offer with another way for people to engage with you. So that's what I really see working today. I see a lot of people really leveraging community and connecting others that are all on that same path. And we've got a lot of very exciting things coming in that realm that I won't spoil now, but you're going to really like what's coming. And I think that's what you're going to see working a lot more in the future is this idea of connecting others through lower price point offerings as they're on this cohort journey with you. Got it. Yeah. So, so in a recent survey that we sent out, 70% um, of our creators have said, hey, you know what, the expertise I'm teaching uh, came from uh, real book experiences. Like they've actually learned it themselves. And they're like roughly half you know, have uh, actual degrees in this space. So how, how do you know if, as a creator, if you have something really valuable to share with your audience? Great question. Great question. I mean, life experience is, is really where it's at. It's not, you know, that's why I don't like 
the term expert because I think mm -hmm. a lot of you don't like even identify it as an expert. Mm -hmm. You just you just happen to know something that's valuable. And so right. so I, I would I would argue the side of everybody has some kind of knowledge or some kind of niche uh, that is valuable to other people. Um, I mean, this this whole company started because I was trying to solve a problem that I had. You know, I created a toy for my kids out of sprinkler pipe, and um, you know, for for a minute, I thought I was going to sell this and build these things and sell them. And and then people were asking me how to build it, and I said, Hey, I'm going to do a course and just teach people how to build this toy. And that's when I realized there wasn't an easy way to teach. I mean, that's mm -hmm. that's a niche. I wouldn't I wouldn't stake my whole future on selling plans for a kid's car wash toy, but. Mm -hmm. But um, you know, it was a need that I had, and and so all of you have needs um, and and some knowledge that you've learned and tips in, in real world experience, whether it's at a job or it's a hobby or at, at home parenting or raising a baby or whatever that uh, you don't need a degree in to other people uh, benefit from that knowledge. Yeah, if you really unpack what's behind that question, I think it's really a question of self worth. It's a question of. Who am I to teach somebody else? Who am I to ask for money for the knowledge that I have? Who am I to put myself out there as somebody who has the capability to teach somebody else? Mm -hmm. And I think when you look at our universe and what is largely changing, is previous generations, it was about validation. It was about where did you go to college? What degree do you have? What certifications do you have? How can I point to a piece of paper or a seal or something that makes me feel comfortable buying from you? All of that shit's out the window. Sorry, can we? I don't know if I can say shit. All of that shit's out the window. Because you're looking at a world today that it's not about validation anymore. It's about authenticity. It's about connection. It's about who do I want to learn from. It's not about where did they come from or what seal did they buy. If you look at the giant crisis we have in college debt today, that is the overhang of that search for validation and believing that because I had somebody rubber stamp me that I went somewhere, I learned something, all of a sudden someone is going to give me something because of that validation. That is way out the window today. If you look at some of the most successful creators, the most successful knowledge entrepreneurs, it is those people that were in the trenches, real world knowledge applied, because that's where you learn the shortcuts. If you've ever hired anybody right out of college, College, they're going to go through that learning curve of this is the degree that I got, but what does that look like now applied to work? If I want to learn from somebody, I want to learn from somebody that's already applied it, already realized where it succeeded, where it failed, and how they can shortcut my journey. So if right now you're looking for validation for your methodology, look no further than the transformation in your customers that you can point to. In the lives that you've impacted, encapsulating that, nobody's going to ask what degree you have or what validation you got. All they're going to know is what can you do to transform me. Uh, so next question. So according to a uh, influencer marketing hub report that recently came out, you know, there's like roughly around 50, 000, 50 million creators out there, but only 4% of them are uh, professionals. They're actually, you know, earning income. So, so what are some steps you've seen for creators that go from amateur to professional? What are some steps that they can take to like make that switch and jump? First of all, just get started, right? I, I, I would, Kajabi. Yeah, I'm Kajabi, of course, of course. I would argue that a lot of that remaining 96% you know, aren't even trying, right? Uh, you know, they're maybe just hoping that they're going to get enough eyeballs to get ad revenue, and they're not trying something like a Kajabi um, and and finding audiences, pockets of people that find their knowledge valuable, and not just hoping, you know, by putting putting a video out there on the internet. Um, so getting started and sticking with it, the whole grit thing, but then also, uh, you know, really honing down. I mean, the term creator is is great, and I know it's broad, but uh, you know. I don't think many of you that are of that four percent are creating just for the sake of creating. You, you know, you're providing value value to the world. You're sharing your knowledge, and so really, um, you know, you're not doing it just because you love sitting in front of a camera. I'm assuming, uh, you know, and so so really think about what what are those nuggets of value, and and don't get overwhelmed by thinking you have to start with a big membership site or a course. I mean, now that with right. the coaching feature of mm -hmm. Kajabi, I mean, you could start with just one-on-one -on -one relationships and, and kind of hone your skills providing value to one person or a small group of people first and then turn that into a course. Yeah, I think that the question of turning pro is really one of the most important in anybody's career. Um, the, my favorite book on this topic by far is Stephen Pressfield's The War of Art. If you want the best book in the world of what it actually looks like to be a creator at pro level and doing the work, the book lays it out masterfully, highly, highly recommended. It's actually one of the reasons, Sean, to your point, that when you talk about turning pro, it's one of the reasons I hate the term creator. Like personally for me, that term is so hard because creator does not intrinsically mean value. Um, mm -hmm. My daughter's two years old, she loves Play-Doh. She makes stuff, creates stuff all the time and hands it to me. And just because she created this Play-Doh thing 
doesn't mean there's any value. Now, the value is in she did something super cool, I'm gonna cheer her on like crazy, and I'm going to literally wait with bells on for the next Play-Doh doll that I get, but just being a creator implies you're doing it for yourself. You're creating this because it's important to you. You're creating it because you want to. Like, for example, maybe I'm a creator that just loves cat mittens and making videos about cats wearing mittens. <laughs> I knew that, it. Right? <laughs> I knew it. I've been very busy. <laughs> but is that of value? Does that matter to the world? Is anyone going to be better other than the cat whose paws are now maybe protected by my really horribly made mittens that I knit myself? Maybe, maybe not. But I'm creating that because I want to see it. This is a business that is about the transformation you create for others. And to me, that is the key difference in creators that have gone pro, is it's no longer, I'm doing this thing because I want to. It is, I am doing this thing for you because I want to. Your transformation is what matters. And when we look at what Kajabi is as a platform, that's why Kajabi exists. It exists to allow you to build a business. It does not exist to have you as a creator. You as a creator, go make whatever you want on whatever platform you want. Put it on YouTube, put it on TikTok, put it on TikTok of tomorrow or Clubhouse if people are still listening to that or shit, go back to MySpace. MySpace I think is still out there. You can create anywhere you want, but if you're not answering that question of what value are you driving for your audience, you can't just expect somebody to pay you because you enjoy doing things. There's a whole lot of creators out there that have created a lot of things. Like there was a modern art piece where a dude just duct taped a banana to the wall and I think somebody bought it for like a hundred grand. That's an amazing <laughs> creator who put that banana on the wall because he wanted to see it there. I don't know that it's gonna offer value at scale. So all I'm saying is if you're looking to turn pro, you've gotta change that inward focus of creator and turn it into an outward focus of transformation for your audience. Makes all the difference in the world. Awesome. Uh, so next question, let's, let's talk about subscriptions for a little bit. So, you know, in our recent survey, uh, we know that people that have subscriptions actually earn a lot more money. So I think 43% of the people that responded said they earn more than $50,000 a year. So since we've launched subscriptions on Kajabi, like what, what have you seen in that space? What's, what's been growing? Like what, what can you offer in terms of like advice for subscriptions and running a subscription business? I mean, I think that's the holy grail, right? I mean, everybody wants to get into this for subscription revenue and they think, hey, if somebody, you know, would I rather somebody pay me one time or lots over and over and over? Mm -hmm. Of course, everybody's going to want that. Um, I think it's harder, right? I, I think I think you need to be that much more committed to the mm -hmm. value you're providing, and and you know, nobody's going to pay you if you don't offer them continual value for that subscription. So I have over the years seen people grasp that and and do it really really well, mm -hmm. and and so I think I think the tools that Kajabi provides makes it even easier. It makes it easier for the Kajabi customer, you know, to to add content and to iterate their course or, or their their membership site or whatever it happens to be and provide that value. But I mean, if the value's not there, people aren't going to continue to pay, and so I wouldn't even waste your time. Got it. Got yeah, it. I think that subscription is one of those concepts that is so provocative and potentially powerful, but also why I love this industry because it gives you unlimited creativity in how you apply it. Mm -hmm. Maybe a subscription or a membership opportunity is better for you and your customer because it gives them a lower price point to start with you. You benefit by them staying longer and paying over time. They benefit by having an easier way to experiment with the content that you have. Win-win on both counts. That being said, I also know some very dear friends of mine that have subscription businesses of giant size that they literally got to three years deep in the subscription. And at three years, they're like, I don't know what to do. I've <laughs> already made everything I can make on this topic. It's all there. I'm three years in, what do I do now? This is where this industry gets so powerful is you think that because it's a subscription, you have to create new content every single month. But guess what? The same gym subscription that I pay for every month that I don't use <laughs> doesn't give me new equipment. I know where this is going. They don't have new equipment every month. They don't have new anything every mm -hmm. month. What they have is they have something that I value yep. that I continue to go, not now, but have in the past, used regularly. So if you have a course or an offering that it has a process element to it, it has a progressive element to it, it has something that someone will need to consume it over time and have the ability to go back to it, refer back to it, optimize on that journey, mm -hmm. you may be able to charge an access fee on an ongoing basis for content that you created once. 
Again, this is really where the value of exploring your business from the customer's perspective, not your own, is going to be most effective. Having those conversations of how they want to consume, what was most transformational for them, but also asking what gets you the desired results. You see, your customer's transformation is what's gonna drive the future value of your business. When people pay, they pay attention. So there is a formula there of how you price, how you package, and when they pay you, mm -hmm. that is likely going to play a big role in the results that they get. So for me, I would be optimizing less for pricing and I would be optimizing more for the transformative value that my customers are getting that the price helps drive. That's where I would be starting that question. Awesome. I'm also a big fan of, of mixing with your subscription mm -hmm. content, whatever it is, live aspects, right? If, if you're going live and, and doing workshops or broadcasts or whatever it might be, people are gonna have that FOMO of, of not wanting to cancel because they don't know what's coming up and what they're gonna miss. So especially for those cases where the content's kind of locked, you can still give them things to look forward to. That's awesome. a huge, if you didn't write that one down, then you're missing it. <laughs> Kenny's point about literally you could have any membership offering just showing up for a Q&A, huge value. They get to ask whatever they want versus you trying to proactively create the content to answer all of those questions. Yep. If you haven't bolted that on yet, you should. Awesome. So I think uh, we have some time to go into uh, Q&A from the audience. Ooh, how exciting. Awesome. Yeah, so first question here. Uh, so what if I'm not sure what I want to do with Kajabi? So uh, would I benefit from this offer? Would a three month be enough for me to figure out how to put my uh, thoughts on practice? I mean, yeah, <laughs> yes it is enough. I, I think, I think if, you've, if you say, hey, I'm gonna get some skin in the game and take Kajabi up on this offer, um, and, and provided that you've got some kind of idea of what you're into, uh, you know, and, and what kind of knowledge you could provide, it's definitely enough time to, to um, you know, start formulating that into some kind of uh, value to provide to people. Yeah, if you're asking what's possible in three months, uh, I believe Kenny built 25% of the original Kajabi code base in three months because it was <laughs> one year of coding before That's going awesome. public. So when you look at what Kajabi has turned into, 25% of what this is was accomplished in three months. That started the journey, that began the momentum. If you're looking for longer than three months, odds are you've either created a plan that is far too complex or you're really not sure this is a business that you want to be in. So what I would say is move confidently with boldness because small actions have really no excitement in them and decide that in three months you will have it figured out. So yep. rather than asking, can I do it in three months? Just get started today, come up with your three month plan and then evaluate at the end of three months, did I make the progress? And then be asking that question. Great. Uh, next question we have in the audience is, uh, how do creative writers make money and build a business? Can you go into detail and, and have some ideas here? Gosh, how many models would you like? Uh, you're a creative <laughs> writer and congratulations, content marketing is one of the hottest growing areas on the planet right now. So whether you're teaching other people how to become creative writers, whether you're ghostwriting, whether you're writing books, um, Tucker Max's company Scribed just, I, I believe, sold or um, either that or he's got a new CEO in place, but I mean, giant eight-figure organization now, which started from an idea. There's no shortage of ways that if you know how to write, whether it's copywriting, whether it's content writing, whether it's coaching, consulting, all of those things are avenues for you to make money. So in your case, the only question is, what type of writing do you teach? Who needs that writing? And why aren't you writing to them to sell it already? Great. Next question is, uh, what is the biggest unmet need? Oh, sorry, did you switch questions here? So, <laughs> so what in your opinion is the difference between an entrepreneur and a creator? Uh, is there a difference? And uh, how are the lines of learning between the two? I think Jay Cron already answered that, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, who are you trying to serve? Mm -hmm. You know, creator. I, I agree with what he said. You're, you're usually, your mentality is just creating something because you like to create it. You know, entrepreneur is somebody who is trying to build a business, right? I mean, there might be some other reasons too. Maybe you are trying to, to change the world or you're trying to provide a lot of value to a certain group of people. But at the end of the day, it's actually business um, oriented approach. And so mm -hmm. I think that's, that's the biggest difference. And, and I would say that if you can say, hey, I'm an entrepreneur, I, I identify as an entrepreneur, not necessarily a creator, Creator, you're going to do big things. Yeah, because you got to remember, a creator is going to say, I like cats and I like mittens, so I'm going to make cat mittens. <laughs> An entrepreneur is going to say, how many cats have credit cards? Hmm, interesting. Not a lot of cats. Got it, got it, okay. You're speaking from experience again. <laughs> uh, you have no idea how hard it's been to get the sales funnel working. They keep playing with all the yarn. They don't use the keyboard. It's terrible. <laughs> so what's the next question here? So how do I transition my course clients to membership? Is there a good starting price point? for memberships and subscriptions. So I think that's a big question that comes up a lot, so. 
Yeah, I mean, first of all, if somebody's already purchased your course and you just try to get them to pay you again and again for that same course they already have in the bag, it might be a little bit hard unless you're providing some kind of more value. Mm -hmm. That value doesn't need to be content, like Jake Ron said earlier. It could just be an, a renewed, you know, um, aspect of you being um, having more touch points with them in the future. Uh, price points, I mean, I've seen it successful in all different ranges. Um, you know, it, it really just depends on kind of the magnitude of the value you're providing. Yeah, give me more money as customer because Apple came out with new MacBooks is probably a tough sales pitch to make. Uh, I don't know that it'll go well. What I would say is as you look at your offering, I would begin reevaluating where in your offering your time, which is finite, exists versus the aspects of your course that can be delivered digitally. So mm -hmm. as you look at the stratification of how I would be positioning it, I would be looking at some type of lead magnet or downloadable option as the free get to know me piece of content that then leads to the one click upsell to your digital course, which is going, or and by the way, I use digital course as a placeholder. This could be a subscription podcast. It could be access to a community, whatever it is that has a get to know me a little bit more with a little bit of money involved. Then I would take that course that body of work that you have and I would add to it a coaching or Q&A element where they have direct access to you on a regular basis. That's going to be another jump up into that pricing strata. So if you think of the course or digital offering as a few hundred dollars or possibly a thousand or more, that's going to be where that lives. Now as you move it from just the course element to the coaching element where you're providing that individualized instruction, access to you in a finite time for yourself, that's probably going to bump that up, up by a multitude. It might take it from $1,000 to $5,000. And then the next element of that would be removing the course component entirely and moving into a consultative relationship, highly individualized. So it's almost like if you think about you're going to go get a suit off the rack, that's your first offering. Then you're going to get a suit off the rack that you take to your tailor and he fixes it. The final offering is you're going to go to somebody, you're going to walk in, they're going to measure everything, which right now my size would be Gordo, and they will put a custom tailored suit together for you that nothing exists off the rack, nothing needs to be tailored after that. It is fit for just you. So if you think about whatever transformation you offer and you try to stratify it in those terms, you'll end up with a course offering, you'll end up with a coaching offering, and you'll end up with a fully custom consultative offering, and you can move people within that and fi figure out where the subscription element fits. But again, applying that metaphor to it, I think you'll find where you want to place everything in that st strategy. All right. So let's go to the next question here. Uh, so can I use Kajabi for a long, complex curriculum that I already have created in a book format? Definitely not. <laughs> it just won't work for no, that. We're, it totally won't work. I heard they're still working on that, but uh -huh. uh, maybe, maybe next year. No, I mean, you've already got a huge head start. Right? I mean, the mm. fact that you already have that written down, mm -hmm. yes, mm -hmm. of course, you could break that down and, and it doesn't need to be a long, complex course even. I mean, uh, you, it, de it depends how you want to break it down, but, but you, can, you could turn it into bite-sized chunks and have the different modules you know, of, of a course. Uh, you, can, you can have all three tiers that Jcron's talking about and you clearly have the knowledge if you already have a book on the subject mm -hmm. um, to, to provide everything in that spectrum. And by the way, in case you already closed your laptop in absolute disgust that we made the joke about no, the reason we were laughing a little bit is because you've actually already done all of the work. You have done the hardest part. You have taken what's in your brain, you've put it in finely organized and edited written word, and you've put it into a format that is completely consumable. Not to mention the fact that in the book, you already have the single greatest lead magnet you could ever offer for every campaign that you're going to build online. So you definitely have the free book funnel, which by the way, Brendan does this better than anybody. Take a look at his. He teaches it in Kajabi, I believe. So the free book funnel leads to the digital course offering is the one click upsell, which leads to everything else. So for you, you probably already have your entire business already built. And awesome. you've got the credibility because you wrote the book on the subject. Awesome. Well, this is uh, this wraps our session. Thank you so much to you guys for coming out here and talking to, to us about uh, everything that you've uh, experienced so far.